All right, so welcome back to Discrete Math, everyone. Good to see y'all in person, for those that made it. Um, <clears throat> I'm finally walking around on my leg a little bit, though it's sore, uh, but still, it's good to see everyone. Now, had I brought an HDMI cable with me today, I would have <clears throat> been using my laptop and I would have used Anaconda. So I asked at the very beginning of the semester that all of you download Anaconda. A suite of IDEs to interact with Python and R and Julia and all the main data science languages. Um, <clears throat> I have a separate video on my YouTube channel about like just opening up Anaconda and running a Jupyter notebook, which is kind of the primary way that I program. However, <clears throat> I don't have an HDMI cord, so I can't use my laptop, and Anaconda is not installed on this computer, I don't think. Uh, I would see it up here if it was. So, that being said, there's another way of doing this without installing anything on your computer, and that's by using <clears throat> what's called uh, Google Colab. So just search Google Colab in Google, and then you should see this link here, colab.research.google. This is uh, hosted online, and it's a notebook type of programming IDE. So an IDE is an integrated development environment. It's a way of interacting with the programming language. So, um, wow, this computer is old. It's not even opening that up. Let me try here. Oh, yes, that'll work. All right. So, I'll get rid of this. All right. So, <clears throat> here's Google Colab. And uh, this. Uh, there it is. All right, so this, I'm going to have to sign in first. Let me go ahead and do that. Um, I'll just use whatever email address that I want. The Rice email. That's kind of the easiest password to remember. Okay, so I signed in. And um, this is what you should see once you sign in. Now, we're going to go ahead and click down here and click New Notebook. And you should see a blinking cursor in a cell. Okay. Now, this is what's called a code cell. Uh, typically, in notebook environments, there's different types of cells. So, for example, um, if you know HTML code, you can have inside of a markdown cell, you can put an HTML code and make a nice looking notebook. So, for example, with my machine learning, cor machine learning courses, both here and at Rice, I host all of my notebooks on uh, GitHub. Oh, no, I forgot my password for this. Uh, I think it's find it like that. So just going back to these, these notebooks. So for example, my lecture one is all about Python. And if you click on one of these notebooks, you'll see that there's like font up here that's not code. That's generated with Markdown code, so like HTML type of code. And then you can even like include, uh, there's like a command for Python type of code, right? So this is the general layout of notebooks. You have Markdown cells and then code cells where you can run Python code. Okay, so going back to my notebook, um, what's the first program of all programs? Print hello world, right? So, so uh, this is the print function. And then I'm going to pass in the string, hello world, exclamation mark. All right. Now, if I go to the end of the line and I press enter, it'll make the code cell bigger. If I want to run this code cell, I can click the little play button, or I can just press shift enter. So first time you run it, it might take a second just because it's hosted online, but then it should be fast. Okay. Now, we see that it said something to us, right? So that's how easy it is to print Hello World, right? Which all of you, as the majority of you are CS majors, you should know where did that come from? Where did the print Hello World, where did it first appear? In, come on guys, the C programming language, like one of the most famous programming books of all time. That thing, right there. That book right there. That's the first instance of Hello World. 
was in this book, in, in this book by uh, uh, Dennis Ritchie and, well, no, that's not, where's the book, this guy. Yeah, the sleep programming page, uh, Kernigan and Ritchie. Okay, so it's one of the, it's, a, it's an amazing book. Like I'm not even a C programmer, but I still like look through this book and like program with it just because it's written so well and the way that it describes the learning of using a program to do stuff, like it's just great. So as CS majors, you probably should own a copy, <laughs> honestly. Um, so go buy one, it's pretty cheap too. It's a little paperback, it's awesome. So back to Hello World, so we printed it out. Now, Python, um, unlike C++ or C, is an interpreted language. It's not a um, compiled language, right? So there's like a P Python interpreter that, that um, will drop it down and run after interpreting language. So you don't have to specify your types, right? Like in C or C++, you have to specify the type of the thing that you're defining, like int, char, string, array, right? Um, and a lot of it has to do with like mem memory allocation, right? Like where, like how that object that you're creating is being stored in memory, right? In Python, you don't have to worry about that. You can just start coding. Now, all of you CS people might be saying to yourself, well, this surely must make Python slow, right? And yes, it is slower than C or C++. But with the hardware that we have available now, it's fast enough to do pretty much anything we need to do. Right, unless you're doing like really heavy duty scientific computing with like astronomical data, like literally like black hole stuff, um, you really don't need anything else besides Python as far as computation goes. Now, because of that, um, there's still a need for like highly optimized code, right? But for everyday programming, Python is good, but in production, it's actually better. Right, so imagine like you're trying to develop an app, right? Like I, I, like I work as a data scientist for like a company and every once in a while I'll get contracted to like help on an app, right? <clears throat> that app needs to come out before someone else's app does. I can prototype and program all the machine learning and data reading that I need in Python in like 30 minutes, opposed to like maybe a week, right? If I can show proof of concept with Python, it gets developed. And then if it needs to, then it will go to uh, someone that will drop it down to C, which you can do. There's a, there's a package called a Cython. You can drop down the code to C, optimize it, speed it up, deploy it. Right? So getting <clears throat> proof of concept first and then optimizing as needed is something that happens in industry. Right? So this is one reason why, this is like one of the many reasons why Python has exploded as one of the biggest programming language. It like is the number one programming language right now. Like that and like maybe like JavaScript's up there. Um, but all the, like a lot of the other ones are like dying off, like Ruby on Rails, um, even Swift, like these types of things, Rust. Well, actually Rust is still around, but like Python has taken over for this reason of how easy it is to use and how easy it is to quickly um, prototype things. Also, the package ecosystem is vast and highly documented. Like, once you understand how to um, look at code in front of you that's Python code and know where to find something out about it, you can start doing things immediately. Right? So um, that's like my little preface about it. It's just, I think that all of you CS majors need to know it. Okay? And as far as this class goes, we're going to use Python to implement an algorithm at the end of the semester. Okay. Um, on that note, while I'm discussing that topic, the end of the semester project, all of you will have to make a uh, GitHub account. How many of you in here have a GitHub account? Okay, so as CS majors or data science majors, you have to have a GitHub account. That's just version control. So that's what I'll elaborate on that later in the semester. Is one of the most important things that you can know, or one of the most detrimental things that you can show up to a job not knowing. <laughs> like if you show up to a job and you have never used version control before, that's going to look really bad on you. Okay. When you're working with a team of developers on data science or programming, whatever, you have to share code. And you do this with version control and GitHub. Or uh, in industry, I've typically used Bitbucket. It's same thing, same concept. 
right? So just go to GitHub and make an account. Just like I have an account. Mine's kind of messy, but I'm not on the job market. Um, you should keep a repository of like your projects, right? Like the projects that stand out to you, you should be, should be presented on your GitHub account so that you can use this when you go to try to find a job. Um, and that's what we're gonna do with the final project in this class. You're gonna make a GitHub account, we're gonna write code to solve this problem and you're gonna push it to GitHub and it'll be listed on your GitHub account. If you've never had done this before, it'll be your first experience, but hopefully you'll continue this with your future classes and like start storing all these things, right? Um, and it's just a nice, neat way of keeping your code together, right? Like for each class that's programming related, you could make a GitHub account and then just store all the stuff you do on that account, right? Um, my machine learning one, that I'm developing this semester is um, lecture one. You should go and look at those notebooks and just see how I'm writing the Python code you can even learn from them. Um, and just get a sense of like, this could be like class one, class two, class three, like whatever, like, like CS 1401 or data 4319 or whatever, right? So make a GitHub account today if you can. All right, enough of that, back to the actual doing Python code. So, <clears throat> Um, we don't have to define the types that we're using. And the fun, there's uh, several fundamental types that you need to know about. So the first type is this string, okay? And strings can be encapsulated with either double quotes or single quotes, but stay consistent. If you're using double quotes, always use double quotes. If you're using single quotes, always use single quotes. So just to illustrate this, print the single quotes. Um, hello, world. Okay. Now, um, we can go ahead because we might be dealing with uh, a bunch of strings. Um, let's just go ahead and assign variables to like not have to type out the string over and over again, right? So I can say like maybe I can do like first name. So this is assigning a variable to uh, John. Last name. Notice how I pressed enter to go down a line. Last name equals to uh, Joe. This up down, make more space, delete the space. But nothing has been run yet. I haven't pressed shift enter. And notice that there's not a number next to the cell. The cells don't have to be stacked on top of each other. You can run cells however you want, just so long as the numbering implies a, a, uh, an ordering of the code. Right? So I know that that cell has been run. I've known that that cell has been run. This one hasn't been run. Okay. Um, I should probably put in a comment here because you, you probably want to know how to do that. To put in a single line comment, press the, the pound symbol like that. So shift three. And then this is a comment above variable assignment. Yeah. So still nothing's run. I'm just like filling in the code in a, in a cell. Now, I know this might seem weird to a lot of you CS majors that are used to programming in C++ or C or something like that, where you're, you're writing scripts and you're running scripts. So like .c extension files, .cpp files, things like that. Um, I was thrown off when I started using notebooks. Like, but now that I'm used to them, I like, it's just my primary way of doing quick tasks and also um, demonstrating code to other people, right? So for example, again, I'm gonna go back to my uh, machine learning GitHub repository because I've been spending a lot of time on it. Um, if I were to uh, work on a project in the team and I wanted to share this project with a like, team manager in a, in a descriptive way, I would use a notebook kind of like this, where I give like a description of what my code is doing. I include the code for them to run, make nice figures for them to look at, give more descriptions, code to run, describe the problem, model the problem, put in that ma nice math type, <clears throat> run more code, do some more mathy things. And it's just a descriptive way of, of sharing code, right? And I can even convert this into a PDF, right? And like send it to someone that doesn't know the program at all, right? So it's actually a very useful thing to know about. And it's like, it's, 
if you're doing anything in data science, you're being you're gonna use this, or the people around you will be using this. Now, if you're designing like a like an application, yes, you'll use like scripts. So like .py is the extension for Python scripts, right? And my preferred editor for that is this thing called Visual Studio Code. So VS Code, it's like my my primary way of interacting with that stuff. So heavy duty stuff, I use that. But when I'm just working with data, reading in data, uh, testing things out, I just open up a notebook. And, or if I'm presenting to other people, I use a notebook and take my time on it. Right. So back to this notebook system. So notice I've assigned variable first name to John, last name to Joe. Uh, variable assignment, you can use any, you, you can name the variable anything you want, um, except for it cannot be a keyword, like the print. Uh, it's a function, right? And so Python has several built-in functions that you should probably know about. And the way that you learn about them is just searching on Google. So like Python 3, which is the version that you'll install on your computer if you install Anaconda. Um, let's just search. Is it using Bing? Weird. Why would it say no, right? Um, so like, this is like an exhaustive list of the built-in functions. I'd say you can't name variables any of these. And if you want to learn about them, you just click on them. <laughs> it's really simple. Python is one of the, mo the most well-documented programming languages that's ever been written. And the documentation makes it easy and fast to learn if you have the patience to read. If you don't have the patience to read, you have YouTube and you can just speed the videos through and watch it. And so you can't name variables that. And also it's convention to uh, name, uh, to use lowercase lettering when defining variables and underscores for spaces, okay? Um, uppercase letters are typically reserved for what are called class objects. So if any of you have ever done object-oriented programming, um, Python is an object-oriented programming language. In fact, I'll get to that much more in a moment. Uh, I, I'll just say it now. Everything in Python is an object, okay? Everything in Python is an object. And what do I mean by object? An object, so like, if, uh, I wonder if I can put in, can I put in, I don't see markdown. I wonder if I can do this. So can I just do this? So does this work? Oh, it does work, All right. So uh, I only use Google Colab when I'm doing like research things with uh, deep learning. Like there's a lot of libraries that are included in, in Google Colab, but that's like, I'm not just, no, I'm not as quick with these as, as I typically am with Jupyter notebooks. Okay, so objects. So um, maybe like Python uh, philosophy. <laughs> Everything in Python is an object. So this is markdown syntax I'm using. It's going to look nice. So what are objects? Objects. Objects are data containers. Okay. That is um, data slash function containers. That is objects uh, store data as what are called attributes. And functions as what are called methods. All right, so once you understand that, you can learn Python very quickly. So for example, I've, I've finally have run this cell, which means I've assigned first name to the string John, last name to the string Bill. Everything in Python is an object. So what are the methods and attributes of these string objects? So this, God, why is it using game? I just, I can't get over that. Why, like, what? Why is, uh, this doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, um, so what was that? Oh yeah, string, so Python string methods. So methods are the functions, right? So 
is a list of all methods. So let's just click on one and learn about it, capitalize. So um, capitalize method returns a string where the first char character is uppercase and the rest is lowercase. Okay, so um, um, I'll say middle name Ryan, under case like that. So notice I click back on that cell and I can run it again by pressing shift enter. So now I'm gonna use that capitalized method and see what it does. So um, middle name. Now to access methods on an object, you use the dot notation. And notice it, in Google Colab, it'll list out all the methods. So I'm just gonna do that one. And a method is a function which means there needs to be parentheses like that. It doesn't take anything in, but it's a function. Okay, so methods always have those parentheses. Now, if I press shift enter, it capitalized the first letter. See that? Now notice I didn't have to do print because, well, this is because in notebook um, IDEs, and there's several different ones, but generally speaking, in all notebook IDEs, the very last line, of the code, you can just run it. And if, it, if that returns something, it's just gonna spit it out. So I don't have to print it out, okay? So there's a capitalized method. What else can we do? Um, let's go back. Maybe, um, ooh, count. <clears throat> count, so what does this do? Returns the number of times a, spec a specified value appears in the string. So there is the string you're working on count value. And then you can like, these look like optional start and end of the string or whatever. We'll get to that later. So maybe um, uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and make a new string. So full name equals to first name plus last name. Have y'all ever learned about string concatenation? It's kind of, it's the, the process of, of joining together the end of one string with the beginning of the next one. So this here should, well, I'm gonna just type full name underneath it so I can see it. John Doe. All right, there's, a, I would like to have a little space in there, right? So I can just add in a space by literally adding in a space. Now there's a space. So I see that, that O appears two times. So let's use the count method and see what happens. So full name dot count, and then let's put in O twice. That's already not a trivial thing to do in C++, right? It takes, it takes some thought, even for those of you that are used to it but I can do it here in, uh, immediately. It's one of the built-in methods on strings. Right? Um, and just, I don't know, maybe I'll look at one more. So notice that that method took in an argument, right? So some functions take an argument, some don't. It just depends, you just have to look at the documentation. That's all you have to do. Um, so, uh, and I encourage you to look through all of these things. Um, like upper, what does upper do? Like you can probably guess, right? That was one thing that really um, was surprising to me when I started programming in Python, that you could just literally guess what you think it should be and it works, right? So if, like, if you have, if there's something that you wanna do, take a guess, but then more than likely, if, you, if your guess doesn't work, it's there. You just have to look online and it'll pop up, okay? But, so notice though, when I did this upper method here, it capitalized everything as we would probably guess, right? But if I look back at that variable, it still, it doesn't look the same. And that's because strings are immutable. So some objects in Python are what are called immutable, meaning you can't change them, but right? you can't change the entries in it. You can't alter it. That's why these methods return a new string. Right? So they return an string. Okay, so um, how many letters are in full name? 
I would like, so this is not just for, for this is not a method. So there's a built-in function to determine the number of things inside of iterable objects. So iterable objects, this isn't precise, but you can think of them as objects that you can index through, that they have like individual items. So whenever you have something like that, you can call what's the built-in len function. So there's eight characters or eight strings. Characters and strings are the same thing in Python. So let's count. One, two, three, four, five for the white space, six, seven, eight. Eight characters. Okay. Um, what about, so what do you think this does? Take a guess. So in, indexing starts at zero in Python, like most other programming languages. And you can index through strings. So like one would be the O, right? Can you take a guess what this will be? You can reverse index. You can reverse yeah. index. It takes the last, the last number. Yep, that's it. Yep, that's, that's E. <laughs> yeah, so minus two would be Oh, right. Um, what do you think this does? It, it prints everything behind the, the fourth index. Yes. Like is that and I like you said everything before the index. So this is an example of slicing. So string slicing. And it's starting at zero up to and not including four. So it's indices zero, one, two, and three. So that's one thing you have to get used to with slicing is that the right-hand side is non-inclusive. But um, in a similar fashion, instead of starting at zero, I could start at one. One is inclusive. So the left-hand side is inclusive, right-hand side is non-inclusive. So that'd be that. Okay. Um, so maybe what if we wanted to print out each of the, the letters in full name, right? Um, we can do that with a for loop. So a for loop, um, basically, so you have for some condition that's iterating, some iter iterating process. And then for each of those iterations, you do stuff, right? So we can for loop, uh, what are we gonna iterate over? I don't know yet. But then we can print at each iteration the letter that we want. So coming from a background in C++ or C, you might, um like do something like well before i get to that i have to tell you about this function so for i in the built-in range function oh this illustrates a important concept so for loop so for i in range 10 we'll look, learn what that is in a moment colon indicates that we're entering into the for loop okay so there's no curly braces, it's colon, you press return, and then notice this white space. Now, in for whatever reason, in uh, Google Colab notebooks, it looks like it's two spaces. It is four spaces, four white spaces exactly. A lot of people use tab, they like configure their IDE, but you can just use tab to tab over. Okay. That, those white spaces indicate that you're in that code block. You're inside the for loop. So let's just run this and see what happens. Oh, and to exit out of it, you get rid of the, the white space and now you're out of that code block. So, so can you guess what range does? Starts at zero and it goes to non-inclusive, indexing by one, right? So let's play with this some more. So we, we have this idea of like not inclusive here. What do you think um, this does? Yeah, so left-hand side, your starting is inclusive, ending non-inclusive. Um, what do you think that does? One, one plus two, three plus two. 
so forth and so on. So if you look at the documentation for the range function, again, that's how you learn things by reading, right? Start, stop, step. Start, stop, step. So if you think about this, this can do some really interesting things, right? You can look at even numbers this way, odd numbers this way, and you can do even weirder things. Like, what about this? What do you think this is? What do you think that does? Start, stop, step. So we're starting at 20, going to five, not inclusive, and we're subtracting one at each step. So let's run it. Again, non inclusive on the right hand side. Alrighty, very nice. Right? This is an easy way of this range function is great. And if you're coming from a C background, you might do something like well, if I want to print out each letter in full name, you might do something like for I in range length of full name and then print full name i like that. That's like kind of as similar as I can make it right now to something like C++. But that's not how you should do it. Python is very specific in the way that it's programming, in the way that its syntax is written. The reason for this is that it's an open source language with thousands of packages that are, that are always being worked on. There needed to, there had to be a cohesive way of writing code that was like, it grew in order for people to read each other's code, right? It's not just about writing like pretty code. It's about writing code that is descriptive to others in the clearest way possible, right? So before I fix this to be what's called a Pythonic way of doing it, let me uh, see if this works real fast. I'm gonna import a package called this. This is a funny little package. It's a Zen of Python. It's a description of how you should program in Python. Not like a, not like a formal like pep a type, but like just a general ethos to remember while using Python. The beautiful is better than ugly, obviously, right? Explicit is better than implicit. Of course, you want your code to be explicit, right? Um, simple is better than complex. These are all like complex is better than complicated, right? These are all ways that you should think about writing your code in Python, but generally speaking, you should all write good code as programmers, readable code, documented code. It should all be written in a professional way. Okay, so back up here, this is not how I would, um, this is not Pythonic. What you should do is this for, I don't know, um, maybe letter in full name, print, but that's the way that you would do it. Notice that I named my variable letter, right? <laughs> Again, descriptive, right? It's, it's telling you what's happening as you, so for letter in full name, it just reads how it should. And it might seem weird not indexing, but it really is the more natural and human way to do it, okay? So for letter in full name, I have that. Now, suppose like I wanted to um, like somehow index them, right? Suppose you wanted the index somehow of the respective letters. Well, you can use what's called the enumerate function. So for I comma letter in enumerate full name, print, I'll just do this at first, I comma letter. Let's see what this enumerate function does just by experimenting with it. Oh, it pairs with each letter, each string, the corresponding entry, right? But what if I wanted to make it look nicer? Like that's pretty, that's ugly to me. I don't like it, right? So maybe I can format this a little bit better by saying like letter I colon and then the actual letter, right? So the way to do this in a Pythonic way is by using F strings. So notice like if I just do the string um, first name and last name like that, 
it's just going to do first name and last name, right? It's not going to convert the values into that string. The way that you do this is with an F string. Well, it's a format string. So put an F in front of your string, and then wherever you have a variable, put that variable in curly braces. And now it will format the value of that variable into the string. So format strings, again, are very Python. Right? The F just indicates to the reader, we're going to format these variables. And you can do anything you want inside of it. And if you're running Python 3.8 or higher, you can even do this. Yep. I guess I'm not, maybe this isn't Python 3.8. Let's see. Again. Hmm. Interesting. I would imagine the Google Colab is 3.8 or higher, but I'll show you all that later. It's a kind of nifty little trick. All right, so I'm going to format this to look nice. So I'm going to do F, and then I'll say like letter I, um, colon, and then I'll put this inside of curly braces here. Close off my string so it's been formatted. Or maybe I'll say like character. Maybe that's what I should say. Name these things. Characters are not just for programming, it's for like writing, right? So I can just use that as more descriptive. Okay. Or if we wanted to be really playful, um, character i, character multiplied by i, see what happens now. What do you think that's going to do? So yeah, you can definitely um, multiply strings when you get rep repetition. Okay. Um, suppose I wanted to ask, like, how would you ask if the letter H is in first name? Like, what do you think I would type? Yeah. Is that in? First name, true. All right, so Boolean, true and false are capitalized. All right, so you'll see that. It's another built-in uh, Python type and um, related to like logic. And you can do all the things that we learned about logic with these things. So for example, true and false, what should that be? False, right? That's the conjunction, right? True and true. True or false. True. Not what you would imagine it to be. So what would like not true or false? Be? You use De Morgan's law, it's going to be false and true, right? Which is false. De Morgan's law, come on. Y'all have to remember that. Out of all of those things, that's the one that I was like, you've got to remember this. Because it does happen a lot when checking conditions to enter into a, a code block. Okay. So, so this, is this equal to double equals is how you check equals. Single equal sign is assignment. So is this equal to not, uh, so is this equal to false and uh, true? That's checking De Morgan's law right there. Okay. So um, we can also do this like for the, the containment. H not in. Okay. Same type of thing. Again, ho I hope that you're getting the sense that it's very readable. Right? It's natural. Right? Um, 
So I think that kind of exhausts what I would like to say about strings. And I think it's a good, strings are the best way to introduce yourself to a language and like start playing with it, right? Um, like, uh, so for example, like making like a triangle, right? Like a, like a right triangle or something. You could do like, um, for I in range like 10, print um, the dash times I plus one. It will try and just playing around and getting in making the output do what you want it to, right? It's like this whole purpose of programming, right? So those are strings. Um, next up, very honestly, a very similar topic are lists. So there are no arrays or vectors, well, they're similar types of things, but lists are like the, the containers um, that kind of look like arrays or vectors that you might be used to. Actually vectors in C++ because unlike strings, arrays are immutable. You can change them, you can alter them, right? So I can say um, sample list. List is a keyword, by the way. It bites up. I can't use list as a, as a name. Sample list. Um, I don't know. Zero, 10, negative two, five, whatever. I can put anything I want in there. I can put strings in there with numbers. I don't have to say anything about the type. The Python interpreter will figure it out for me. It's fine. Like if I wanted to, I could put in full name too. Whatever. And if I want to look at it, But for the sake of running through a few functions, I'm just going to, um, I'm not going to put in a string right now. Lists are great because you can put in numbers with associated names and fields and things like that. Like it's like the beginning of structuring data. Right? Okay, so there's my sample list. Okay, so. Um, how do we, if we want to figure out how many things are in there, what should I do? Oh, yeah. LEN for now, right? There, anytime you can iterate through an object, like that looks like there's entries, right? You can call this LEN function on it. For example, let's like that, there's four things in there. But then you bring up a point, there's methods, right? Anytime you, you find an, yourself encountering a new object or anything new in Python, there are methods to it. And possibly attributes, which attributes are just store data and methods of the functions. So um, let's go ahead and look up these things. List methods. Depends. Let's read about it. The pin method appends an element to the end of the list. So you do you access that with the dot notation append, and then you put in the element you want to stick in the back. So if I do like sample list.append, maybe I want to put in like a three. And then I looked at my sample list after doing that. Now there's a three back there. Okay, pretty nice, right? Um, figure out a list, count, you can imagine what that would be. Pop, insert, all of these methods are, are useful. In fact, sort, all of you have probably had to per sort a list before. This is really simple in Python with this, the sort method. So like sample list.sort. Notice nothing appeared. It's because that mutated the object. It didn't return something. So the cell didn't know what to spit out. It just mutated the object. So um, if I look at my sample list now, it should be sorted from smallest to largest. But what if we wanted to go from largest to smallest? Well, is there a way to do that inside of this method? And the answer is yes. There's a keyword, reverse is set by default equal to true. What happens if we set it equal to false? Or no, it's by default true. No, 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 there he goes. I didn't read down enough. Default is false. Let's set that equal to true and see what happens. So, um, Sort 
the first equals true. I like spaces. You should like them too. Don't jumble up your code. It makes it hard to read. All right, there. Sort of from largest to smallest. So again, we're like repeating the same thing. Okay, we encounter something new. We we can check what type of thing it is. So for example, type of sample list. It's a Python list. That's a built-in function type. You know what it is. You search on Google that methods, look them up, and you learn about what the thing is you're working with. And some of them might be useful. For you. Okay. Okay. So, um, how would I find the maximum of, of sample list? The maximum. That's like another thing that you you might program. In fact, we're going to look at algorithms to do that in a few weeks. So, take a guess. The max function. Right, so there, there happens to be a max built-in function in Python. So sample list. What about minimum? Take a guess. <laughs> minimum function. Yep. Min. What about if I wanted to sum these things? It's the sum. Okay. So um, you would think like so maybe we wanted to we want to like um, make a list of even numbers, right? Maybe we can do that with a for loop, right? So we can do something like even list, it is empty, right? And then do a for loop for i, we know our range function um, up to 10. Now we're going to 21 because we want to include 20. Um, we'll start at zero, go to 21 in increments of two. We can do even list dot append i, and then let's look at even list at the end after that for loop. All right, so that's a list of even numbers. That's one way to do it. That is not the Pythonic way of doing it by any means. And um, we can also, I, I should probably tell you about the modular operator. So instead of just incrementing by two, I can do that, and then I can put in an if statement. If i mod 2, modulus is the remainder. So i divided by 2, if the remainder is 0, that means that it was even. If the remainder is 1 or something else, it's not even, right? So if i mod 2 is equal to 0, colon, notice how I had to white space into that code block, right? If you're doing a conditional statement or a loop, those things are contained in their own code blocks of Four white spaces in in So okay, let's see if this works. It does. All right. However, this is not the Pythonic way of doing it. This is coming. This is like what you would do if you were programming C or C plus plus. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. Like I like I said, C is like one of my favorite languages. But Python is very specific as to how you should program. All right. Like if you want to be a good programmer, there's a way that you do it. And this list should be created as follows. Um, I'll say um, number or number in range 21, if number mod two equals to zero. And then let's look at this even list again. That's the Pythonic way of doing it. So first, let me get rid of this conditional statement here and just show you what this does. So we're going to work with sets very soon, like maybe a week and a half or so. Set builder notation, we've already seen with the rational numbers. What goes inside a set? Something subject to condition, right? So same idea here. here. What goes inside this list? Number, such that number is in this range. And that's exactly what it, it prints out. But we can also add conditions on that. We can say, oh, we can say if number, the remainder when divided by two is equal to zero, that condition also dictates what goes inside that list. 
So what goes in there, number, where does number belong in this range, and then only if that number is even. So this is called list comprehension. You can do this with lists, you can do this with tuples, which I haven't talked about, we can do this with dictionaries. This, this notion is used all over the place, and honestly it was really confusing to me when I first started programming in Python because I was so used to looping a certain way. However, if you think of it from like a mathematical point of view and like think of it like a set, objects such that what are the conditions on that object? That's what goes in there. Okay. It becomes more natural to read. And sometimes they'll get like long looking and you can, if it's too long, you can do something like this. You don't have to completely space it over, but it's, it's kind of the Pythonic way of doing it. To so line it up like that, it does the same thing. Okay. Um, maybe I want to square those numbers for whatever reason. Double star is how you square things. Multiplication is a single star. Now those are all those square. Okay. Um, so those are lists, and that's kind of like um, once you know strings and lists, that's like you can start like doing a lot of things. Right? Um, what else? Tuples are the same thing as lists, but they're immutable. So tuples, so even a tuple is number for number in, I'm gonna do this a different way now, zero to 21 in increments of two. Hmm. Interesting, I made a generator by accident. Actually, I'll see if I can do this. Notice the tuple is a keyword. I wonder what happens when I do this. Yeah, so that's a tuple. So that keyword or that built-in function tuple converts the list to a tuple, okay? And um, you see the, the parentheses instead of the brackets. So you can't change these. The ordering is set in place. You can't remove, you can't add to it. It's like fixed. So anytime you have data that's ordered and does not need to change a tuple is what you would you would store it as. If you need help with what these things are, you can even type question mark um, tuple, and you'll get a doc string of like what the thing is. Okay. So those are tuples. Um, I have a question, Professor. Yes. Can you change the value of those numbers in the tuple or just not the order? Um, you can't, so let's just, let's experiment, right? So let's try, so zero, right? One, right? So those are the, we can index through tuples the same way as lists, right? So let's try to reassign a variable. So even tuple at the zero entry, let's try to assign that to something else, like maybe um, three. Error, right? So when these things are immutable, you can't change the entry view. It's like, it's, it's, it really is like um, fixed, right? Just like with strings, you can't change this, a single character in a string. You can't change an entry in the tuple. You can do that with lists though. For example, my even list. So go ahead. So basically tuples are immutable? Yes, tuples are immutable Python objects. But I can change entries of lists. Um, um, no. Well, you, what, by manipulate, what do you mean? Let's try it. What would that do? So if I say something like even tuple times three, It made three copies of it. Right? It's not going to change the entries, but it'll return these copies of it. Okay, so um, next up, there are so tuples, basically the same as lists, just immutable. The other type would be uh, the other type that I would cover next would be sets. But I'm not going to do that in class today. I have videos on my YouTube channel about sets. Um, what I'd like to briefly mention are dictionaries. Dictionaries are incredibly important. 
So dictionaries are key value pairs. Okay. And these, each key points towards a value. Okay. Now the keys, um, you can't repeat keys in a dictionary. Um, and keys uh, have to be immutable. So like strings are the keys, right? Or like a single number, right? Or a list, right? But the keys that the values that they point at can be literally anything you want. So you can have dictionaries that point at other dictionaries that point at other dictionaries. And this is a way that you could design a database. So like before I knew about databases, when I started programming Python, I had a very specific problem I was working on. And I ended up like making a database out of dictionaries. And it's very natural. Why? For example, let's make a dictionary. So um, employees. Uh, maybe I'll just, yeah. Um, I'll say this is a dictionary. You can do this in two different ways. I'll show you them both right now. So I'll say, um, Randy, uh, and this will point at like, um, maybe I'll say employee uh, salary. And then I'll give this like, um, that, just in, in whatever number. Notice that instead of a comma, you can put like underscores to indicate where the commas should be. And it will interpret that as still as the same number. I could do that, but it's harder to read. That's much easier to read. Okay. And then another key. Like um, whatever, right? There's like employee salaries, right? Um, and then maybe I can, let's just like run this and see what it is, if it works. So now if I want to access information, that's how you access the information, right? So the keys and key values, right? Now, um, so how can we like string these things together? Um, uh, Let's say, um, I don't know, uh, uh, maybe like vendors or something. I don't know, whatever. But uh, you can like start really stringing these things together. Um, for the sake of time, maybe I'll just like. Hopefully it's run. Make it like something like this. Like employees, where we have the keys of the names, and then there's another those keys point at another dictionary. Right? So in fact, I'm just gonna copy this. Come back over here and paste it. So I've made this like so what's going on here? This key points at that dictionary. That key points at that dictionary, right? So if I do database employees, I get that dictionary back, right? And if I wanna know specific entries, maybe I'll look at Jane. So you can start like stringing together like nice, it's like really that's, a structure that would make a database. Okay. Brackets, yes. Just say, just like with, if you want to index through something, it's with brackets. Dictionaries, you can't index sequentially. It's like there's keys, so you pass the key into like where you would have done an index. So it's like this accesses that database. I mean that dictionary, and then that key in this dictionary points towards that value right there. Like going back to like that. And then she went to vendors at um and then you want to get fancy. I was actually pretty psyched on this thing that I made here. 
So what's going on here? Let's just see, let's see, based off of what we understand, which is we just had like a crash course in the ideas of Python. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on. For field and database. So hopefully that's descriptive. So database is this thing, right? So let's just say like for field in database. Current field. Oh, it's it's the keys. Right? So for each key in there, print, oh, the field is a string, right? The keys are strings in this case. Look at that capitalized. I'm making sure that I capitalize it. I print out a nice little bar there for field two and database field. All right, so for each field in there, I'm gonna loop again, and then I'm gonna print something, print something. Again, when you watch this later, you'll go back and look at this and try to like decode what's happening, but look how it formatted it, right? Just makes it look nice, right? Just like it would appear in like a like an actual program without a GUI, right? like if you're returning something to a terminal. Okay. Well, I think that will be it for today. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.